The MTG Podcast is a virtual space for women and men in the tech and creative industries. Tune in as we put it all on the table, sharing authentic life truths as we sustain and empower each other in search of our tribe. We're more than a designer. We're more than our name badge. We're more than the work we produce. Welcome to the More Than Graphics Podcast. We're We're that that tribe. tribe. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Danielle. I'm Cicely. And together we make this unionist tribe that is called MTG. (laughs) Um, I love this episode already and I haven't even begun it. Like, can I just say that out loud? So we've been talking a little bit off air and just kind of having this good, great conversation in and around uh, one diversity and inclusion resources, white people, all the things. And I'm just kind of like, can we just keep like, I just feel that that energy was just so real. So I'm so excited to kind of continue this conversation. Um, In this particular episode, we're talking about fearless. And Cicely, I know we have always had a discussion in and around the season about, you know, doubt, being fearful, things to do, the things we talk about out of fear, the things we tell ourselves, you know, out of fear, um, things along those lines in I just feel like this is a very heartfelt conversation that we can continue to have um, time and time again. If you haven't heard our previous episodes in and around fear, doubt, all those things, please go check that out at mtgthepodcast.com. What are you doing? Like, just go do it. Um, It is amazing. Um, But since I kind of just want to catch up with you, how's things in your realm? How are we doing? I'm busy, as always. (laughs) Um, I am entering the last. 14 weeks of the RN program. So I will finally be done December 7th. Day. And if nobody ever <laughs> in life has been ready for anything, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm done. I'm already, I'm already at the end. My mind is already at December 7th. Um, but the that. rest of life is happening. Just got back from vacation um, this week. So I feel refreshed. I feel renewed, ready to go and ready to be over with the semester and um, uh, some other projects brewing, which, you know, once they kind of come a little bit more into fruition, I will share those. But um, some other things happening and, you know, gearing up for October birthdays and fall. And oh, all my gosh. Things. So, yes, Man. very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. I feel like that's a whole other category about itself, like the the fall birthdays, because mm-hmm. we both have kids with fall birthdays. And it's just like, whoo, one more time. Like, take take my wallet. Just take my wallet right. now here, while we're at it. Money. Take all of my money. Take all of my money. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. Okay. So wherever you are in your season, whether it's fall or spring, depending on what side of the world you are in, um, we just kind of welcome you into the space where we can openly encourage, inspire, and educate each other in search of our tribe, which we hope this tribe is your vibe. So today's topic again is fearless. And I just kind of wanted to bring up some general generalized topics in and around fear, women in tech spaces, things along those lines. So just to kind of kick it off, technology remains one of the sectors with the largest gender pay gap, currently standing at 16% compared to the national average of 11.6%. Um, so a lot of people that we hear in the circle, when they talk about this topic, we hear about how we need to promote women, right, into um, more leadership or senior positions to create more role models, right? That representation matters. And I kind of just want to get your feedback on that, Cicely, before we jump into our guests. Like, how how does this impact you right now? And how does, and I can talk about how it impacts me as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think one of the things is um, working in fields that have been predominantly female, like nursing, for example, retail, cosmetic sales. Um, I've always kind of noticed like the pay is not where, like, you know, the pay is not paying. It's not what it should be. Um, Particularly in nursing. I know like this is kind of a national spotlight where, you know, there's one camp who's like nurses should make so much money. And then there's other people who are like, but if I were the CEO of a company or, you know, the CEO of a hospital making millions of dollars of a bonus during COVID and never touching a patient, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. But because it is a 95% of people in this field are women, we should be happy with $30 an hour, $40 an hour. And to not, you know, to not gloss over that that 
in a lot of respects is a lot of money per hour. But if you look at the work, if you actually understand the work that nurses do and the fact that Mima's life and your baby's life and the baby right. and the mama's life is all in our hands. Like we are the last stop of defense um, before things can get like real crazy. If mm-hmm. you look at it that way, 30 and $40 is not enough for me to lose <laughs> my livelihood and to never have a job and work again. Like that's not enough. So um, I mean, like in terms of just like healthcare and how that works, I definitely see that happening all the time. I've seen like males make more money because again, like there's so few men in nursing that they are paid a little bit more because, you know, they have families to take care of. Like, okay, so me and my kids just don't need to be taken care of. And the other women that I work with who have, you know, even if it's not children who have um, older relatives to take care of or friends, whoever, it doesn't even matter to sustain themselves. Like it just doesn't make sense. Um, And then in the tech space specifically, I have had the pleasure of working for mostly um, female founded and female like ran and owned um, like healthcare tech companies. And so I definitely see like with them, it's not necessarily the pay so much, it's the funding. And Mm -hmm. I know this trickles down into black women and people of color who are in the tech in the healthcare tech space. I think I saw saw something about venture capital. It's like 5% or less. Yes. And black women and women of color. And I'm like, well, that's gross because there's so many amazing ideas, so many um, female founders, women of color who are really at the forefront of these issues because we're the ones who are mostly not heard when mm-hmm. it comes to a lot of these things, especially in healthcare. But 5% of funding, like that's disgusting. Like it's gross. Like I, I can't even make it make sense. So I'm definitely seeing that more so um, in healthcare. And that even when you have um, some of the bigger companies like the CVS and the United Healthcare and companies that are branching out and doing more, mm-hmm. look at the C-suite. Number one, what color are they? Number two, what gender are they? And number three, like where where's the movement? Like where's mm-hmm. the, nothing's happening. The diversity, the inclusion, um, the inclusivity, it's really not there. And you're supposed to be taking care of America and all of America's people. And we all know that most of America at this point is in the global majority. So I'm just going to leave that there. Ooh, we from the Church of Sicily. Come on now. <laughs> Snaps. You got me fired up. I'm about to take off my shoe. Like, here we go. Um, I love this. And I love the fact that you're on fire about this too, because it should make us, it should motivate us. It should upset us. It should put us in a place where we're just like, how can I advocate more? How can I do my, do my part? How can I encourage other people who don't look like us to do their part? There's a yeah. huge underlying like value of all of uh, deliverables that everyone could be contributing toward, toward this goal specifically. But man, can we just overall say that it sucks to be under the 5%? Like I can't, I can't even begin to like start on that conversation because it does become a trickling, angering effect. Like you just get more and more upset. Like, what can I do? Um, What else can I do? Um, And we've already given so much of ourselves already. Too much. And so there's this whole like, you know, what else can we do? No, no. What else can you do, actually? Um, That's where the conversation really starts. So, oh, man, I just love the whole conversation. I'm I'm not even going to skip the next bullet because that was just on fire. I want to leave it just (laughs) like that um, because I really want to introduce our our next guest, um, Whitney Knox Lee. Cicely, you can take it away, girl. You on fire. Yes. Whitney, she, her, is a Black American mother to Black sons, a wife, civil rights attorney, and anti-racism and DEI, and an anti-racism and DEI educator. Whitney is also the host of Impostrix Podcast, a podcast that affirms professionals of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in career. Her work aims to create more racially equitably and culturally affirming workspaces, communities, and systems. Welcome to Whitney Knoxley. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just sitting here like, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that. <laughs> Girl, Thank we absolutely love me. that you are here. Um, welcome. Okay, so I, I want to dig right into this because I love the, I already know kind of um, a little bit in reference to what it is that you do, but I really want to talk more about DEI and that's where a lot of my questions are coming from. Absolutely. Um, so I really want to hear more about your journey um, about how your journey has um, kind of developed into this DEI educator and your personal motivations behind focusing on anti-racism and DEI work. Yeah, I did not. I, I fell into this on accident. Um, and as I'm sure y'all and your listeners um, have had similar experiences, what happened was 
I came to work one day. I was working down in the South, um, in South Georgia at a law firm. I came to work and another black man had just been killed by the police. And it touched me so much that I didn't feel like I could work. Um, I, I didn't feel I was having this like weird moment of like, okay, but my community is under attack. Like there are things that feel a little bit more pressing than me showing up to work right now. Um, like I didn't know what do I do to take care of myself in this moment? Like wh how do I show up to work with all of these feelings, this fear, anxiety, sadness, um, trauma, around these killings that had happened. And this was before, well before George Floyd. This was, um, I think in 2015 or 2016, perhaps. Maybe 2017. At any rate, from that moment on, it became clear to me that I could not separate my identity as a Black woman, as a Black American, and also as a woman, um, with work. And I, I would say that I didn't even realize that I was doing that until that moment. Because, you know, the other spaces that I go into in my life, I could go to those spaces and be like, oh, man, I just don't really feel good today because this happened. Um, you know, this is how it's affecting me. But I never really felt like I could do that at, at work. And so I worked at that time in an environment that was predominantly Black women. And we were all feeling this way, it turns out. And so we all started having this conversation to support each other um, in that moment and then started thinking about, well, who else in our organization is feeling this way? And what about our clients? Um, the law firm that I was working at was a nonprofit law firm that worked with low income um, folks in Georgia. And, you know, a, a lot of our clients are black and brown people. Um, and we had offices throughout the state. And so it just, you know, having that realization of I can no longer separate these two um, is really what launched me into my interest in what I would learn is DEI, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sometimes it's um, belonging is added. And these days, it's being um, kind of framed differently, like anti-racism in the workplace work or decolonization work, or there's a lot of different ways to describe um, this push that we're experiencing right now. Um, and it's, it's a wave. There have been previous waves. There will be later waves. It's not anything new. It's just this current iteration um, of trying to get workplaces to be more inclusive, more equitable, and, and more diverse. Um, and so we can talk about each of those a little bit if you guys would like, but that's really you know how I got into it. I started asking questions in my workplace around what are we, like what resources are available? Like, can I talk about this stuff? And if I'm feeling this way, like how are our clients feeling? And how is that impacting how they show up? Like in our interactions and whether that be are just regular client meetings or whether that be in court? Like, are we, can we just take a step back to acknowledge that like black and brown people are being repeatedly traumatized by what we're mm -hmm. seeing, not only in the news, but what we're experiencing like in our lives. Like what I am personally experiencing today, I am having trauma from. So can we just mm -hmm. take a step back and like acknowledge this? Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's so good. I love the way you you voice that because I do feel like that's always the overlooked part because quote unquote equality means that everyone is quote unquote the same. And we all know the underlying factor for that is is horseshit, to be really honest. Just simply because simply because what affects me is not going to affect someone else. The privilege of someone else is going to diminish the the opportunity of someone else. And I think that is what continually becomes a conversation in and around these topics when we experience this level of trauma on a daily basis. Almost, it almost feels like daily, every day there's something happening in the news. There's something happening in and around our neighborhoods. There's something happening in our, in our area of life that affects us more, more intentionally as people of color versus people not. And I think I love the fact that you continue to echo that, that, that constant kind of storyline of asking questions. That's super, 
super important. Excuse me, I'm choking up over here. Um, I think that's super important because we all need to do that. We all have to, on some level, both ask ourselves the question, questions, start asking our workplace those questions. And thank goodness that you also were in a place where the your environment kind of collectively reflected who you are on that sense because there's a ton of women of color who are not and they're not in a place where they can actually feel comfortable enough to even begin asking those teaser questions without getting the side eye or the oh no or the uh, whatever that may be right getting getting um put down yeah. And, you know, I'm so glad that this is this conversation is happening during your month of fearless because this takes risk like it, it. It's not it's not available to all of us, you know, and that's just the fact of the matter, depending on the position that we hold, depending on I don't what we look like, um, what our outside of work circumstances are, how bad we need this job. Like not everybody wants to have these questions asked. And in fact, many people view these questions as challenges. And when you talk, start talking about challenges, you start words like insubordination start getting flown around, or you need to watch your tone start floating around. And so this is, it's so perfect for, for this theme of fearless, because I do think that being active in your anti-racism efforts and being active in your diversity, equity, inclusion efforts does take risk. And it comes down to whether or not we're willing and capable um, to take that risk, whether we have capacity. And let me say too, for black and brown people, it's not always on us. And it's okay for us to determine that right now we don't have the capacity to do it. So I don't want anybody out here listening to hear me saying, that it's on us, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that it's, you know, it, this takes risk and you always have a pass as far as I'm concerned um, because we do our part by showing up. Well said. <laughs> Since I know you're like back here clapping. I know all the things. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do love that you mentioned and like that you pointed out very specifically that not everyone has um, that opportunity. And it's really something like I didn't think about until you just kind of said that. I was like, oh, you're right. So typically, like in healthcare specifically, like you mentioned being in South Georgia, we're in Kentucky. So even here, even though it's more diverse than a lot of places, you know, I'm using in quotes, it's more diverse than a lot of places in Kentucky. Almost every time I'm a nurse in a space or I am a like a per- person with a license and a degree in a space, I am one of the only people that look like me. Um, when I worked actively in newborn nursery and I was in, you know, postpartum units, always the only black person there. So very much like you mentioned, when those things would happen and you'd have to come to work and like, you know, separate life and whatever's going on in the world from work, it's almost impossible to do. Just like you mentioned, like, yes, you know, we talk about women in tech, but more specifically, we can't talk about women as a whole without talking about the intersection of us being black women in tech, because I can't be a woman without being black too. I can't be black without being a woman too. Like all of those things, they go hand in hand. So very much what you said, um, some of us, unfortunately, I mean, I do now, like now that I'm in, um, the tech space, it's a much different, I'm working with different people who have very broad and open minds, but very much, this is not something I would talk about at work in a brick and mortar hospital situation, because we're already dealing with a lot of stuff there. People get very sensitive about the word racism and, you know, I'm like, how are y'all sensitive? But it's like happening to people that look like me, but okay. But um, I know that you know that people be getting all up in arms about, you know, the word racism and race and color, and I don't see color. And that's something that you hear echoed around these parts very often. And, you know, me and my husband had to have a very um, interesting conversation about why that in and itself is racist and it's problematic. And we talked about those sorts of things um, in our home as well. When you're married to someone who is um, from the the mountains of caucus, you must talk about these things. (laughs) He said mountains of caucus. From the mountains of caucus. Um, I'm guilty. Damn. I had to. I'm sorry. He knows. He knows. We talk about these things. We talk about these things all the time. So he knows. Like when I, you know, I be I be calling him out. Y'all people need to stop. All right, Mr. Stamper. You gotta stop. (laughs) (laughs) But I digress. But I just wanted to point out that you've made a very good point that a lot of times um 
women of color, black women specifically, we're in these places where we can't like verbalize and talk about these things. So I realized that like my person that I talk to about these things is my mom. She's also a black woman that's in the medical space. So she understands these things. And it's not something I can talk to my white friends about, not really my Asian friends a lot of the time. Sometimes my Latina friends, we can kind of talk about some of the similarities there, but I have to wait till I get home or I have to, you know, call mom on the way to work and talk about these things because she comes from that same point of understanding. Um, but in that same vein, like kind of, at, I, wanted, I wanted to kind of know like at home, how do you handle the, these things? Cause as we read in your bio, as a black mom and a black mom to black sons, how do you create like an environment for your sons where they're comfortable talking to you about these things where they can tell you what happens at school and you're able to help them navigate those things. Like I know this as a parent, it can be kind of hard and getting them to understand the ways of the world. And especially um, with children who are neurodiverse, that could be another level of things. Mm -hmm. But what is a way that um, you're able to foster that conversation at home, make sure that it's open, especially with boys, letting them air out their feelings and emotions and making that a safe space for them? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. I, I forgot to say at the outset around like, why, what, why am I doing this? And, and how did I get into it is part of it is self preservation and like, wanting my children to be when they show up for work or when they show up anywhere, to not be considered a threat. And my children are still young. My children are, um, I have one turning three on Monday. He's my neurodivergent. And I have one turning six in October, Libra. Um, yes, yes. So he's October 12th. I'm October 14th. October is just simply the best month of the year. Um, so anyways, he, um, so these, these children, like my question to myself is how do I keep them alive? Um, and specifically, they are considered a threat to a lot of people. And so are black women, but certainly black black boys. Um, and so they're not, they're of the age where they're still cute, um, but soon they will be at the age where they're quote, a threat. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it's so important to me to be talking to as many people as possible about race imperfectly even, it does not have to be perfect. Um, just so that we're having these conversations because we're still dealing with people who think talking about race period is a bad thing. That's where we get with to colorblindness is we're coming from a generation of people who learned that even pointing out somebody's race is bad and they don't wanna be bad. So they don't wanna point out somebody's race. Like similar to if you saw somebody with a physical disability and you don't wanna stare at their amputated leg um, because you think it's rude. No, we like, okay, fine. We don't want to stare. Staring socially in our in our environment is is rude, but it's not rude to ask questions or to be curious. And you know, and so now going coming back to your question, how do we deal with this in our household? Um, my husband is a light-skinned black man. So my children are light-skinned black kids. I don't know how. Um, because I, if you're looking at me. You see, I am not light skin. But so much of our conversation right now is around skin color. And um, my oldest son identifying himself, he thinks he's orange. And he thinks that he, his brother and his dad are orange and that I'm brown and that he wants to be brown. Um, and so we talk about the varying shades of skin color within um, Black communities specifically since we're Black Americans. Um, and he also, he goes to school with a lot of Black people. We live in a Black community. So honestly, he sees white people, but they're the minority, big time. So like we, you know, he, when he sees, he has a couple of white kid friends. And when he sees just any young blonde kid, he's always like, hey, that's my friend, such and such. And I have to be like, no, white people, they do look different. <laughs> You know, and so that's that's just another white child, you know, but that's not our friend. That's not the friend that you're talking about. Um, but, you know, really one of the things that happened more recently that made me really sad was that Everett, my older son, really wanted to be darker skinned. And I really want him to just love his skin. And so I, you know, we talk 
to them about loving their skin and loving mommy's skin. Like we don't have to, one doesn't have to be better than the other. They're just different and that's fine. Um, and so that's, that's really what we're dealing with right now. Um, but I know it'll change. I know it'll get more tricky. I know it'll get more dire. Uh, you know, like I, we don't have um, guns in our house. Like we don't have um, toy guns in our house. And we've, I've tried to explain this to my older son, but he still doesn't quite understand why he can't have a toy gun, um, especially when it's a neon color. Um, but I, I can't not see, you know, Tamir Rice. I can't not see our kids being shot down because they have a toy in their hand. Um, and so right now we don't, you know, we don't have guns and that's just one of the, one of the things. I get it, man. I so get it. I relate to this on so many levels. All of my children are different hues of Brown as well. And I think it's really, um, encouraging to hear other parents who have similar <laughs> um, struggles, talks, things along, along those lines in, in that same tone. And I completely relate to that as someone who is raising really, 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 really fair children versus um, raising a child who is completely encompassed in his melanin. And I absolutely love the fact that when I talk, when I say that, I mean, he is just loud, proud, all the things. Okay. Like he is just this brown golden goddess. I just love it. Like, I love it. But at the same time, encouraging, I see that level of confidence in my children. Of course, I'm biased. But I want to be able to inspire and encourage that same confidence within themselves, just as you, Whitney. So I love that that is a common tone um, as we raise kids of all different backgrounds and ethnicities, especially um, coming from a, min a minority, right? Like coming, understanding that the world sees us a little bit differently um, than everybody else. And again, that is just an, uh, it's an unspoken but known truth, right? And it's becoming more and more loud that we talk about that topic. So I love that. And the second part of that is really just understanding, like, um, you know, understanding the dynamics and the tone of which we come from as people of color and understanding that we need to um, also address that within ourselves. So that's something too, I really want to kind of like bring up some of these quotes in here though. Like um, when I think of my sons, I think how do I keep them alive? Oh my gosh. Like this was, you know, this is definitely my oldest, my oldest who is on spectrum. I immediately thought of Elijah McC McCain, McC McClain, excuse me, of him immediately when I thought of my son. That could have easily been him in a hood. He could have been low on sugar. He could just being his awkward, normal self and, you know, walking into the gas station and never coming back out, like not even leaving that block ever. Um, so I do openly think about those conversations on a regular basis. My kids look at me like, mom, these are just not just, but, you know, these were people that went through a situation that won't be me. But I'm like, oh, honey, no, history has shown us repeatedly that it very well is you <laughs> and it won't stop. It's not something that's just going to end because a generation got loud enough. This is something that will continue to be an ongoing conversation, ongoing, ongoing battle. As you pointed out, Whitney, it's just in the moment. This is what we're dealing with in this moment, but this will continue to happen. So how do we get ahead? How do we step ahead? How do we think ahead? And um, that's kind of the process as I listen to you as a parent, um, you know, go for, go through with my kids as well. So I really appreciate your candor. I really appreciate your uh, transparency in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't want to take us off track, but talking about autism and and this debate around like ABA services and the type of support mm. that we're going to get for our children, like the thing for me and my husband in terms of support was he's already different because he's a black child. Like I I I love my son exactly how he is, but other people don't. And so if I need to figure out how to teach him to, I don't know, show up a little bit more as he, as people expect him to show up, then that's going to be about his safety and not about me trying to make him somebody different than who his beautiful autistic mind, you know, who he is. And I know you guys can relate also having autistic children. So it's, it's a trip. It's a trip. We have so many, y'all, we have so many things that we connect on. <laughs> Oh yeah, so many. Things. I'm right. I know. I feel like oh, we're gonna have to have part two on this one. Like yeah. it's for real. Um, I just kind of want to continue that that conversation in and around like 
the understanding, uh, uh, kind of what we talked about a little bit earlier in the intersectionality of understanding diversity um, yeah. and how you approach this into your personal DEI education efforts. So could yeah. you provide like an example of how you're, how you've navigated a couple of uh, dimensions of that? Yeah. So this, the intersectionality being this idea or this reality that we all come to the space with different identities. Um, and that identity may be as female or as male, as, you know, trans, that identity may be as disabled or not disabled or your race or, you know, whatever the thing may be. And we have to understand that, particularly when we're talking about women and female and um, women identified folks, is that feminism did not include Black people. Um, and so it's just because we are operating in spaces that are diverse with, I don't know, different with women, for example, does not mean that our outward expression and our outward blackness is going to include us in whatever diversity issue or equal opportunity thing is going on. Because, you know, for me, I am a black woman and I feel like I lead with my blackness more than I do with my femininity. And that at the end of the day, you know, what matters the most is my skin color, because I can certainly be around women and feel not included um, and feel like I'm having to stand up for myself and respect, you know, to, to demand respect from other people. Um, so in terms of this intersectionality and how we deal with it, um, I really have taken the position of focusing on race. Um, there are other practitioners who focus on other things and who specifically focus on intersectionality. But I think in our society, that blackness is still at the very bottom of the, the totem pole. And it's something that a lot of us cannot change or pass as white or pass as something different than being black. I think that how we are treated is worse than how other people are treated. And when you add blackness on top of transness, for example, that's lethal. Like that's that's a deadly combination. It's already deadly to be black, but it's extremely deadly to be a black trans person. Um, so whenever I'm teaching, I'm starting from our historical background around race. I'm starting from um, colonization and acknowledging that there was a whole world here before colonization. And I move forward through American history um, to talk about what race means, what race means in society, but also what race means economically and what race means politically. Um, I believe that we're a racial capitalist society and that our country makes money off the backs of black and brown people. We always have. And right now that's what we do. And so I also try and bring some of these concepts into these conversations when I'm when I'm doing DEI work. Like it's not simply about making sure that there's equal numbers of black people and Asian people or whatever. It's not always about making sure that there's one person of color that's in the C-suite. It's about inclusion. It's about power sharing instead of power hoarding. It's about celebrating Blackness or celebrating Asianness or celebrating whatever the cultural identity is and not simply tolerating. You know, it's about being safe, being psychologically safe. And so I think in order for us to get there, we need to have a, a better understanding of how we got where we are today. Um, and we have to be real and truthful and honest about what's happened. and. And we have to be real and truthful and honest about how we perpetrate these aggressions towards each other. Man, that was a whole word. I mean, <laughs> I, I truly believe that we cannot move forward unless we understand how we got where we are. And I love that you intentionally come into this conversation with a level of, no, we've been doing this work. <laughs> no, we've been doing this. We've been building We've been creating, we've been developing, and 
due to our circumstance and our relationship with each other, we keep getting tore back down or we keep getting the legs knocked out of us. We get the wind knocked out of us. We get the life taken from us. And I just feel like that is extremely powerful that we're able to at least come to the table and say, okay, look, these things have happened. These things have expired. What are we doing that's going to actually push us all forward instead of focusing on the he said, she said, the um, black or white, the intentional conversations in and around the opportunity of being a brown person in America. And I think that continues to be the echoing words that you are saying, Whitney, and I, I love it. It's on fire for me. I like embrace all of it. Um, I think there needs to be definitely more conversations in and around the space and go for you, girl. Like I hope somebody is hiring you based on this conversation today. Um, <laughs> you need some coins. Okay. You need some coins for this because this work is hard. It's aggressive. It's grueling. It focuses people to be uncomfortable based upon their own priorities and propositions. And the fact that you continually come from a educational standpoint to help bridge a lot of these gaps. And believe me, there are plenty of them um, in this particular area for women in tech and women creatives. But the fact that you continue to bridge these gaps is super important. It really ignites me. I'm truly inspired. <laughs> well, and I, I appreciate that. The, the thing that I wanna throw out there is that because this work and these conversations are so charged and so difficult um, and so uncomfortable, my own personal philosophy is that the words that are coming out of my mouth don't have to be perfect. So if I am trying to have this conversation or if I have a question about somebody else's culture or ethnicity or race or how they just experienced something that happened that I experienced one way and I'm trying to figure out like, am I the only one that experienced this? Like I, how I have the conversation or even if I'm trying to call somebody in or call somebody out, these words don't have to be perfect. I really try and be as tactful or as respectful or whatever the the nice like white comfort term is. Like I try to do those things, but like I'm not going to get it every time. Um and cuz this is all a learning process, we're learning how to be in community with each other in a way that we are lifting each other up and not again where we're just standing next to each other and don't know each other. Like we're learning all of these things. And so um, I really think that it's important that folks do not let their fear of saying the wrong thing stop them from trying to have these conversations. And if you're a white person that's listening to this, I really think it's important that you not let your own discomfort get in the way of having the conversation. Um, because white discomfort is not the same thing as um, not being safe. It's simply discomfort. A word. I was trying to get off mute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but yes, oh, I very much love that you said that. Um, and I think a lot of times too, like with discomfort as a society, like when someone's uncomfortable or, you know, they're experiencing discomfort, especially when it's coming from, as I like to call the global minority now, um, and when it's coming from the global minority, like it's much more exacerbated. Oh, we've got to make sure this person's okay and that everything is fine. But if I'm uncomfortable, I'm the problem. Like, why is she making this about her? Why has it always got to be a black thing or a white thing? So I think it's very, um, when we go into these conversations, anyone of any ethnicity, but especially white people, just making sure that you are not playing the victim in the situation and that you're really being receptive to hearing what people are telling you. Because a lot of times it's not personal attacks, it's me or other women or other people of color saying, in my experience, when this happens, this is how I feel, this is how it makes me feel, this is my interpretation of it, and this is how it happens to me versus all you people are bad and all of you, you know, do these things. That's not, I feel like that's, what, you know, it's the interpretation. We may say one thing, one thing, but it gets misconstrued into something else. And then people want to play the victim. And that's not what we're here for. So I appreciate when you said it's not going to come out perfect. And that's okay on either side. I know some white people who are like, I'm sorry, this is going to sound bad. I'm like, girl, just say it. And we'll, we'll talk through it and work through it because I'd rather you explain to me where you're coming from so we can get to a mutual understanding instead of sitting here having your biased opinions and me thinking something about you because of what you said and how you said it, but us never coming to an understanding of how you arrived to that conclusion 
or to that point in the first place. I'm okay with having hard conversations. Life is hard being black. Like what, what else, right? Like this is fine. This is perfectly fine. Um, but kind of how you mentioned about fear, how would you define fearless? Like I very much understand that we all have some sort of fear around these conversations. We have fears, you know, on a personal level about our children and about our own bodies and just things that we see happen in our community. But for you, what does fearless look like and how do you navigate in, in the fearless space? This is tough um, because I actually think my my definition of fear my definition of fearless does include fear, um, <laughs> and I think what it means is walking through it anyways, essentially, and and maybe like doing an accounting or doing a you know as objective as possible consideration of of what's happening of what the situation is that we have fear about and then deciding to do it anyway, or deciding to do something different, just really addressing addressing whatever it is. Um, I know for me, I, I recently experienced an anxiety situation, crisis, really, it was a crisis. And um, it was about fear and not living up to my perfectionism, I think is is the thing, you know, my super womanness um the thing so anyways i have all these things going on in my life and basically everything a straw broke the camel's back um and i think when i am living in fear and anxiety oftentimes it's stopping me from doing the thing um it's like a barrier like the thing is on the other side and then there's fear and so i feel like fearless is going through the barrier um and just you know, maybe shit's going to hit the fan. Like that's possible. It's possible. But believing that I will be okay. Um, if I'm having a spiritual moment, believing that God's got my back. If I'm not having a spiritual moment, believing that it'll be fine. Like that I'll, I'll get through it. Um, because I always do. I love that. I, and Amen. even, uh, yeah, I, definitely. I, I feel that for people who are, a little bit more on that, you know, techie, real techie for all you nerdy, nerdy girls out there, um, scientific who are in the lab. I, I think when we talk about overcoming those barriers, um, it's kind of in a formulated way, you know, un ruling out our constants, ruling out the variables that continue to change for us, but still come out with a positive or steady variable outcome anyway. And I love that you talk about this because in a lot of areas, especially for women in tech and women creatives, we talk about this barrier. We talk about the thing, whatever that thing is, that wall, that mountain, the hill, maybe it's just a pit, you know, maybe it's a hole, maybe it's a pothole <laughs> the other way, not up, it's going down. Um, you know, all those type of things that are barriers for us to get across. Um, something that's always been encouraging is looking at the things that have happened to get to that point that you've already overcome so that you already know that this is something smaller than what it, smaller than what it is. And I love the fact that we can continue to have conversations in and around diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to thinking about these big mountains, these big barriers, these things that are causing so much drama or whatever stress in our life, that we can actually look at the things that we have been able to do. Um, 300 years ago, we were able to, you know, overcome a lot of things. Um, you know, a thousand years ago, we were we were undergoing a lot of personal trauma on, on a much more realistic basis and a much more traumatizing basis. Yet here we are as a progression of people, not not even from here, from a completely different place that have been uprooted, planted here, and still thriving through whatever things that are coming our way as a as a people, as a nation. So I just feel like that's something too to kind of consider when we're talking about these barriers. Um, sometimes it can be something small, just as I want that pay, right? I want that, um, <laughs> I, I really do want a pay raise. Like I would, I would love to give myself a pay raise <laughs> right about now. Um, but it's one of the situations where it's like, I know that I've, I'm capable of doing these things because I've already done X, Y, and Z. And so I just kind of want to put it in that mind frame for people who may not be on the spiritual train as much as we are, because Lord, we are all about that. But I think it's on a much different level for people who are a little bit more calculated. You know, how can I imagine something that isn't there? Well, that's because the people before you, the generation before you, the eras of, of, of brown and black people before you saw nothing and they still found a way to do something. And so that is something that I really hope that people 
are encouraged and inspired by, by the power of our own equity of ourselves. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Like that there are generations of black and brown people who survive, like somebody in my lineage, two people survived uh, long enough for me to be here. Yes. You know, and then and then there two people survived. And then there, you know, like it's that's just so amazing to me. Um, yeah. and, and how do you honor that? Right. Like. Right. Yeah. I feel and like that's like, a big part of it. How do you how do you do that with your life? I <laughs> look, I don't know. I. <laughs> I really don't know. I think trying not to get stuck in the fear, trying not to. I, I don't. So I'm really, I'm really trying to um, tap into some resources that I have not tapped into. And one of those is like ancestral knowledge and like somatic knowledge, body knowledge, um, and listening to myself and to my intuition. Um, that's never, I'm, I am one of those calculated people. I'm very logic minded. I'm very, I got to see it to believe it. Um, and your woo woo stuff is great, but it's not for me. Like I'm really trying to push myself because I, it hasn't worked, you know, like the way that I do things hasn't, hasn't worked in terms of my mental health. Um, and so I'm really trying to listen to my body and listen to uh, draw on some of these more woo-woo resources um, so that I can maybe have a different perspective. And just like we were talking, this, this acknowledgement of that I'm here, somehow I'm here, despite what my family, like I'm a Black American, which means I don't know where my family came from. And so that's what that means to me is that I don't know. I don't know nothing about where we came from. I don't know what happened past maybe two or three generations in my lineage. I don't know. Um, but something, somebody survived. And that is just so empowering for me whenever I'm facing some obstacle that seems insurmountable. I, I know that like our people were enslaved. I know that they were ripped from their homes. I know that like if my direct ancestor wasn't, then like their family was, their friend, their loved one, their whoever. Like I know that people within my lineage have experienced unfathomable heartbreak, torture, and that I'm here. So whatever whatever's eating my lunch today, I mean I could feel it for a second, but like Let's keep it, let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Let's listen to my body. Let's listen to, um, you know, the, the people that love me and support me. I have a sister circle and um, they really try and call me out on my BS. <laughs> <laughs> I got one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let me listen to them. Let me listen to my husband, you know. Um, and I, I think that's really just been how I've been trying to honor honor that, honor my lineage, honor the folks that came before, um, and even honor the folks of the civil rights movement. Because as, to your point and what we've talked about multiple times during this show is that this current DEI situation is just one wave. It's just one iteration. And, you know, we have the Black Panthers. We have the civil rights movement. We have the MLK folks. We have, like, history upon history upon history of activists and activism um, that has just meant so much for where we are today. Um, and we can do that. Like if they could do this, we could do this. Yeah, I love that. I, so I, I really hope y'all are picking up what she is laying down y'all because it is for real. Um, and it's totally, and I love how genuine this conversation is as well because a lot of us don't have it. We don't have the answer. We don't have it figured out. We can only learn from what's been done and make steps to improve so that we can try something different the next go around. And I just feel like we're in a constant flux of experimentation in and around this subject of diversity and equity and inclusion. And I also feel like there's a level of um, self-acceptance. There's a level of education that we all have to do in order to know how to move forward. 
and not continue to spin our wheels and be in the same continual cycle over and over again. So there's just so much work here, obviously, to unpack, but I want to be like, um, you know, respectful of time and all the things. <laughs> um, but I do want to kind of ask a couple of questions, one in particular. Um, we talked about obviously defining what fearlessness is, but maybe some actionable steps in and around DEI work where maybe you can discuss a specific instance where your educational efforts led, led to some tangible improvements, um, maybe through an organization or a community in terms of combating racism and fostering inclus inclusivity. Um, could you share anything along those lines? Yeah, absolutely. So in the, the first job that I was telling you about in South Georgia, um, we started uh, what many organizations have now, which are these like voluntary race equity committees where you got brown people doing a lot of work and not getting paid for it. So we started one of those. Um, and that group, although undervalued, did great work. And one of the things that we did, we learned um, a couple of years later, well, we already knew this, but it became people felt more comfortable speaking up about, about this experience that our intake workers were having. Um, like many organizations, our frontward, like public facing people um, are brown people, black and brown people. We had various um, intake folks who spoke Spanish as their first, as their native language. And so what would happen is white people would call for legal help. Um, but when they heard the person on the line, they would say, I want to speak to somebody that speaks English, or I want to speak to a white person, or I can tell that you're black, I want to speak to a white person. Um, and making, you know, disparaging remarks, being really offensive and that nature. And historically, we did not have an agency policy as to how to handle this. It was kind of like in, in the nonprofit space, if you've ever worked in a nonprofit, you know we're all about the people that we're serving to like the detriment of our staff in some extent, in, in some instances. And that was the case here where folks felt as though they needed to engage with these people because that was the job and we needed to put the job before our own dignity. Um, so what we did was we created a policy that empowered people to hang up the phone, literally hang up in their face. If, if they didn't feel like they could take that, whatever um, comments were being said, we asked people, give them a warning, let them know this is not appropriate. Um, they don't get to talk to anybody else. They don't get to be elevated to a manager. Because what does that say? Like if we're elevating somebody who's problematic around race or around gender or around disability or any of these other protected classes, um, what does that say if we're saying, okay, you don't like me because of the thing that I can't even change about myself. Okay, sure. Go listen to the person that you want to talk to anyways. No. So now um, at that organization, they do not have to elevate it to anybody. They can simply hang up the phone and they can hang up in your face. Um, and that was a significant change, um, not only as far as empowering the person who works for us that's on the line, but also in terms of showing that this organization has your back. That like when we're talking about um, anti-racism efforts and harassment, or, you know, a lot of times it was sexual harassment. Like that was the big thing, sexual harassment. Nobody really cared about race and racial harassment. Um, but like now our employees know that we got your back and that means we don't expect you to have to experience this type of abuse in order to earn these coins. So that's that's one thing that I'm really proud of because it's something that like, I, I think as I'm talking about it now, it's like, well, duh, duh, this should be in place. But how <laughs> many of our organizations have policies like this in place? Um, especially those like service organizations. Like I said, we are a racial capitalist society. We do anything for money, mm -hmm. anything. And at what point do we start having boundaries around what we will do for money so that we're protecting the people that are um, working for us? Mm -hmm. So if I need to turn away your business because I don't like how you're behaving, then 
that is what it is. And for folks that are in like a private practice or who own their own businesses, you know, I think for us, part of financial security means like personally and professionally means that we don't have to take money from people that we think that we don't want to work with, you know, for whatever, yeah. you know, if they, if they can't respect who I am and how I'm coming to this organization, then I don't need their money. Um, but I also realized that I got to be in a situation where I can not accept money. And that's mm -hmm. a difficult position. I mean, that takes work. That takes a lot of, it takes some luck, you know, it takes work. It takes a lot of things. Oh, I love that. And I, I, I really like what I'm inspired by most is that it's a nonprofit, right? Because yeah. I feel like if this was in a more corporate sense. This would be kind of a, almost a no brainer. Like in our, for my business, I would tell them, you know, no, like if I don't want to work with you, I won't not no, <laughs> and you have to live with that. But in a nonprofit way where you're about serving people, right? It's all about giving back to the community. You know, when your own community kind of tells you that I only want certain things from you, you know, where, where do you, yeah, that intersectionality, where do you meet with that? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's genius. I love mm -hmm. the idea of creating, that should be like a more common thing for nonprofits. Like I'm only going to be able to do this work if you're able to do this other work, right? Um, and just kind of meeting each other in that common place. Um, and when you're not able to be, meet each other in that common place, just understand that we can just let go. We can just shut that down altogether and we can move on to the next. Um, yeah. And the one other, before we move on, sorry to cut in, the one other, like the thing that's been really big for me recently and people that I've been working with is where the physical spaces that we are working within. And what I mean by that is what is the culture of power within this space? Who is this space made for? A great example is if I am going to a conference and I walk into this conference, I don't see any people of color. I only see white people. I see guns on the walls and deer heads. I see artwork that only has white people. I don't see any um, handicap accessible ramps. I don't, you know, us with autistic children, I don't see any mention of um, sensory spaces, um, sensory friendly spaces. How comfortable or safe do I feel? And I've had this experience recently where I went to a conference and it felt like the sunken place. Y'all seen Get Out? Okay, it felt like the sunken place where folks were so eerily nice, but there was nothing about the space that made me feel like I should feel comfortable or safe. Um, and I couldn't focus, I couldn't concentrate on the content that I was supposed to be learning because I felt so uncomfortable. And so I think for those of us who are in corporate fields or who have our own business and employ people, really, really taking time to consider where are we having people show up to work? So if I am a vendor and I want to go sell my service or my product at a conference, where is this conference at and who is showing up? And who am I trying to send? Because am I trying to send a person of color to a Republican convention conference because I have some kind of non-political product that I'm, you know, and I, I think it's so important because it does really impact how um, focused we're able to be, how present we're able to be when we're in these environments where we're supposed to be working or where we're supposed to be learning or we're supposed to be of service to somebody. But if I can't even feel comfortable there because I feel like this space was not meant for me, then how am I going to do any of those things? And so I think that's another like tangible, tangible thing that if you are somebody that has any kind of influence over what the office looks like, if you have any kind of influence over where we're gonna hold our next annual retreat, or if you have any kind of influence over, I'm on a, a planning committee for a conference, where are we gonna hold this conference? Like really think about what the physical space looks like. Because the physical space, some of us are like vibes people where we walk in the room and we feel vibes. Others of us are more visual. Others of us, somebody has to diss us in order for us to not feel safe. Just know that like, if you got folks who are walking into this room and they don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe, then 
you're not getting 100% of them. And that's what you want as their employer. You want them showing up as their best selves. Oh my gosh, I love this so much. <laughs> There's so many good things here. Cicely is like Kermit the Frogging, blah, 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 like all things. Um, I, I want to like, I want to go a little bit further into that space because I love, uh, I just love this whole conversation, just all in general, all the vibes. I, I get the vibes even, even here in this virtual space. So I feel that. I, I really want to address like this area where we, if we don't, if we're not able to show up as our best selves, especially as people of color going into spaces that are not as opening or not as vibrant for people of color is there. How can we get the message across or how can we tell them early before in those planning stages? Like this is something that we are interested in, or this is something that, you know, making those suggestions, how do we get to that point where we can speak to someone or is there a direct person that we should be, you know, sending these suggestions to, um, to kind of help open up those those doors and make it a little bit easier for that collaboration to happen. Yeah, so my strategy that I always take is asking questions instead of telling somebody something. And usually, well, I shouldn't say usually, sometimes asking questions is still not, it doesn't, co it doesn't go over well. Um, but the reason why I ask questions is because I don't want to assume that I know, because I might not, I might not know what's best. But like in this situation, if I'm thinking about what kind of conference center it's going to be at, I can maybe ask what what's available at the the conference center for you know somebody that might be disabled or um, have a mobility um, disability. I might ask about like, are there going to be spaces at this conference where I can bring my child and my child can sit and and you know feel safe or whatever. Are, um, I can ask what, what city is this in? What city are we going to hold this in? And um, do you know who, what the demographics of the people that you expect to attend are? Um, another great question, who are the panelists that are going to be there? And like, do you, can I get a list of who you've invited so far? Um, I think as with a lot of things, when we're trying to create more inclusive spaces that this work does fall on us as folks of color. And so um, I don't have a good answer for you. If you're somebody that wants to bring something up, but you don't want to be the one to do all the work. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Because that's, unfortunately, that's what happens. Um, and I think this is, again, why it's so important to do anti-racism work in mixed race spaces because that's how we build informed white allies who can do this work instead of us. Um, because I do think that we, I would love to shift some of this work onto white people um, instead of having to do all the things all the time. Right. Um, so I think that's where I would start is just asking questions. Um, and then if you have feedback afterwards, I think I, I feel more comfortable usually after the fact, unfortunately. That means that I've sat through something that is uncomfortable and now I'm having to bring it up. But like mm -hmm. this particular conference space that I've been to, I will never go back. And I will tell anybody anytime that this place comes up why I will not go back, that it feels mm -hmm. like the sunken place and why it feels like the sunken place. Um, and you know, if somebody is on a planning committee that's thinking about going there, hopefully they'll, they'll think twice. Um, and I've also done, I've written it down on like the feedback forms for the conference. So that's a great way or place to do it is when you're doing a feedback form. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's something internal, I would suggest that the planners create an opportunity for people to give feedback or create an opportunity for people to give suggestions on where this thing can happen. Um, and maybe it needs to be anonymous in case people are afraid of, you know, becoming that person because mm -hmm. I've been that person and it's not fun. Okay. I love this. This is great feedback. I hope that people who are in listening range of this episode really kind of grasp some go-to tools, some resources in and around um, having to ask questions, right? Like that's how we learn. We learn by asking questions. Um, I feel like we're more bold about it but uh, in terms of overall asking questions. But when it comes to asking questions about us, 
right? Things that are a little bit closer to home. Um, it's a little bit harder for us to want to want to, right? To want to. And then of course the the everlasting, okay, well, you're asking this question that means you want to also help <laughs> do, which is not always the case. It's just, I just want to add this suggestion. So yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. That's yeah. Important. And I I think I just want to share in terms of the language because sometimes we don't always have the language to describe what it is we're experiencing. Um, my good friend uh, at Just Roots Consulting calls this a culture of power. And it's essentially a space where you walk into the space and you're able to determine who is valued in that room and who holds the power. So similar to like if you were selling your house, I don't know if you guys have sold a house before, but a realtor might come in and say, take down all of the personal um, images, the photographs and all of that stuff. Take down any ethnic looking artwork because you want the buyer to come in and find it a blank slate. Um, mm -hmm. But they're identifying that you value X, Y, Z things because of what's up on your wall, because of the artwork that you're showing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's really what I'm talking about is like how the physical space looks and feels and does it tell me as a person of color that I'm welcome, that I'm celebrated, that I'm loved, or does it just completely ignore that people who look like me exist? Mm -hmm. I love that. Okay. Uh, Cicely, do you have any, any feedback or extra questions? Um, I was just going to say that like, yes, when you um, kind of talked about walking into a room and then like you being very observant because you're more on the logical side, for me, it's all vibes. I'm floating on vibes all day, every day. <laughs> so if I walk into a room, I've had like experiences where I've not been able to explain to people. I'm like, something ain't right about that. And they're just like, what do you mean? I'm like, I can't explain it and I don't even care, but I know it's time for me to go. Like speaking of the movie, Get Out, same thing. The vibes were off the whole time. You couldn't have paid me to be there because the vibes were off the whole time. Um, so I love also that earlier you mentioned, you were kind of talking about, um, wanting to tap into spirituality. And I know a lot of people, like especially black community, Christian community, that we get like really antsy about like witchcraft and like hoodoo and things like that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I always, I laugh about it because I'm like, to be honest, like spirituality is a part of black culture. It's a part of the African diaspora. Like we are all spiritual beings innately. Like this is something, and I don't know, this may even go deeper to people of color in general. I mean, you see it with Native Americans. Um, I've seen a lot of spiritual practices with some of my Asian friends, like, you know, pre predating Buddhism and things like that. Like they're very much in tune with the earth and the moon and the tides and things like that. So I always tell people that like, you know, if God made the earth and made these things, then he made these things for us to partake in. So, you know, getting in touch with your spirituality, getting in touch with our ancestors, it's not witchcraft and hoodoo and voodoo and all that good stuff. I mean, it could be, but you know, there, there are ways for that to happen, but being in touch with our ancestors and those who came before us, like, I honestly don't feel like there's anything wrong with that. And very much in the conversation, like you mentioned, we come from a line of so much trauma, so much heartbreak, so much strife, so many unimaginable things that like, I mean, I still, I know that slavery happened. I know what happened. I cannot still sometimes wrap my mind around the horrors because like, I just, I won't allow my mind to go there. But mm -hmm. if our ancestors survived and then they, like we are here for a reason, very much like you said, and walking through, like being fearless doesn't mean Unfortunately, like the definition, it does not mean the absence of fear. It just means that we are working through and we're working through the fear, working to the fear to get to the other side of it. So very much, I just wanted to kind of um, reiterate that, that I fully feel where you are, but your girl's all about vibes. I'm, I'm all about <laughs> vibes. All day, every day, vibes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, speaking of a vibe, uh, Whitney mentioned why allies, and I want to bring this back up because we talked about this a little bit off air about, you know, finding people, finding our tribe. Even our tribe doesn't even look mm -hmm. like us. And we speak a lot to women in this platform, all women. Um, that includes white women, but especially to the women of color. And I think it's really interesting that we both kind of <laughs> uh, talked about, you know, what that allyship looks like. So I kind of want to, just kind of review, like for you, what does that look like? What does that look like for people of color? So for me, I think it's important for us to take just a small step back to acknowledge that not all people of color are the same. Not all black people are the same. And one of the things that I've been loving in this podcasting journey for myself is just learning more about other people of color, like other cultures of people of color and how I can be an ally. Because 
The other thing is I've really, up until recently considered like ally as a word for white people and not as a word to describe me as a black person being supportive to another black person or to an Asian person or whatever. Um, so I just wanna say that we all have capacity to be allies because we're just not the same. We're all, we are not the same. We have very different experiences that we may not be able to relate to each other on, on a personal level. Um, and so how can we step up to be a support for the person who we can't necessarily relate to? Um, I think that starts again with asking questions. How can I support you? What is it that you're feeling? Um, how can I, you know, do you need me as maybe a person that has more power in this space to say something or to do something or to support you? Like, I don't know about y'all, but there have been plenty of times where I've been not only the only woman, but the only black woman to say something. I don't know, to like, push back to ask the question. And I would just love it if somebody else would say, yeah, I'm curious about that too. Like you don't even have to form more words than that. Like it would just be really helpful sometimes to know that I'm not alone in my curiosity about this, but also for the people that I'm speaking to, to know that it's not just Whitney. Because I will tell you, when you are an ally or when you are somebody that uses your voice, you will be labeled that person. And the moment that you're labeled that person, I think that I started becoming less effective in that space because they learned that maybe they just need to appease me two out of three times. And this is the third time where they're just going to ignore me. So like, it's always helpful, in my opinion, to have people that will just back you in the space in real time. Um, I also think, you know, allyship looks like using your power to advance, you know, whatever the, the mission is, the purpose is, um, and doing so without having to be told or asked or, you know, whatever, the, just taking the initiative to be like, I actually have a question about this. Um, can you answer this question for me? And, and starting the conversation there. Um, and you can even just say, look, I don't have personal experience with this. I'm just thinking about how somebody else with a different lived experience might feel about this. I, they may not, this may not come off too well for them. This may not be a comfortable place for them. Can, can we talk about what this is actually going to look like in practice? Um, I think also an ally really gives space for people to just be. Um, sometimes we just need to, to sit in community with each other. I know for me, that's the case. Like I might have a colleague who wants to know how I'm doing today because they can see on my face that I'm not doing well. And maybe I tell them I'm fine or I don't feel like talking about it or whatever. And then they tell me, and I have one, one friend in particular at work, her name is Nicole. She says, look, just so you know, I value you. And I'm so happy that I work with you. I don't know what's going on with you, but I see you. And now I try and say that to people because when she said that to me on this day, I had come up, I was crying, wiped off my tears, came up and she was the first person that I saw right after I wiped off my tears at work. Um, and just having those, those words said to me, you know, without her even knowing what I was experiencing meant so much to me. Um, because what I was experiencing at that point was imposter syndrome and doubt and fear and hurt that I didn't want to get into with her. So um, another way to be an ally is just to let people know that they that you see them, that you see them, that you honor them, that you value them. You guys don't even need to have a conversation about it. Um, but for me, that's been so impactful. Oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. <laughs> I love this. I'm I'm inspired and all the warm, fuzzy feelings, just hearing that you've received um, that level of comfort and support in that way. Asking those deeper questions. I mean, man, I think that's the whole theme of this conversation is ask. You'll never know unless you don't ask, right? Right? You'll never know unless you ask. So um, I love these conversations in and around allyship. Um, I love the fact that we, you know, we, we talked a little bit earlier about 
um, you know, people that have been able to connect us in these spaces um, and how you were having, you know, had a, a, a ex extra conversation in and around, you know, um, allyship and what that looks like, like not really knowing the person, but the fact that they believe in you that much to be able to, you know, inspire you to do the things that you want to do or you aspire to do. That's powerful. And, you know, not to get all like super, you know, techie in it, but, you know, every time that when I hear that word, you know, I see you, I'm, I'm always going straight to, unfortunately, the blue people, I'm going back to Avatar, like I'm Navi land, like, okay, cool. Um, I see you. Um, I don't even, I can't even remember the exact phrase, but I'll, I'll, maybe I'll do it later. But it's one of the situations where I, I really appreciate that you are so transparent in and around this journey, because that's how we all learn. Um, and when we go back to the beginning, before language, before words, it was always action. We had to mimic and understand each other's actions in order to do the next step or move to the next thing or understanding the communication of each other. It was always through a level of movement. And so I really kind of want to go back to those earlier conversations um, to kind of help summarize this episode in and around, oh my gosh, Fearless. I hope that you are feeling extremely encouraged right now. <laughs> Um, and maybe a level of education that you may or may not have known about around um, DEI. And I really hope, too, that you just kind of had a moment where you're just like, yeah, I see this. I feel this. I walk into this and I'm coming out a little bit lighter or I'm coming in a little bit more knowledgeable or I'm walking out feeling more inspired and encouraged to to stand up and ask questions, to find more of my tribe in the workplace that uh, may or may not be as comforting to me as I desire it to be. Um, so I really thank you, Whitney, for like coming to us with so much knowledge and positive affirmation really into this into this conversation that can feel really heavy at times. Absolutely. I'm so I'm so glad that um, we have the chance to have this conversation. Awesome. OK, Cicely, do you want to wrap us up with uh, our flash questionnaire? Dun, dun, dun. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, again, thank you for the vulnerability as well and the honesty, like all those things very much appreciated. So now we're going to pick your brain in more of a fun way. But <laughs> okay. um, so with the questionnaire, you literally just say the first thing that comes into your mind, just kind of whatever it's, it's off the cuff, whatever you're thinking, even if that includes some cuss words, um, you can go ahead okay. and say Great. He's like, ooh, okay. <laughs> she said even better. Yeah. Um, so first thing, something new you've learned in the past year, a life lesson, hobby, fun fact, et cetera. I've learned about anxiety. See, I love it. Um, favorite vacation or getaway spot? Destin, Florida. Oh, see, she, she's on it. Sweet snacks or savory snacks? Sweet. Okay. See, she's like, girl, easy. Harry yeah. Potter or Star Wars? Harry Potter. Digital books or physical books? Digital. Uh, specifically audio. Okay. Yes. Okay. I can. I can um, you know, time. we're moms. <laughs> right. Who has time? Right. <laughs> so yes. This has to be a multitasking. <laughs> reading is a multitasking event that happens on the drive. So. A hundred percent. Audio books. Yes. And we're not reading kids books. We try to listen for our minds too. So right. Yes, very much. Um, if you could go back in time, where would you go and whom would you see? You know, talking about our ancestors, I would love to go back in time to an ancestor who I don't know. Maybe, maybe specifically the ancestor who became free. Amen. I so that I can like learn about what their hopes are for for our lineage and also learn about who our lineage is and what Ooh. slavery for our family has looked like. Yes, that was deep. I love that's one of my favorite answers in five seasons of podcast. I love that. Answer. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, what is your love language? So how do you um like mm -hmm. to receive love and or how do you give love? Acts of service for both. Acts of I service. Love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm a um it's physical touch to some extent, um is how I receive well I think physical touch is my secondary for both giving and receiving, but Okay. For receiving, it's acts of service. And then my husband's, his is also receiving acts of service. So that's now. I After eight that. years, that's my thing too. I love that. Um, and last but not least, the best part of being a grown-up. You know what? Being a grown-up has not been fun recently. So I'll tell you, when I was a child, 
the reason I wanted to be a grown up was so that I can have all I could drink 7 Eleven Slurpees <laughs> because they it. were a dollar. My mom would say, you know, money doesn't fall on trees. When you're an adult, you can have as many Slurpees as you want. Uh, turns out, as an adult, calories do something different to my body. Um, you know, the energy that's coming in from the Slurpee doesn't always feel good on my frame. Ooh, uh, right. And they're so no I longer can't, a dollar. And they're no longer, <laughs> so I can't have the all-you-can-eat Slurpees, but that was always something that I looked forward to. I love that. I love that very honest answer. And we asked that, <laughs> like, one of the main reasons, because we all know that being an adult sucks <laughs> a right. lot of the time. Right. So we asked that because we, we were trying to, like, drag out the positivity, like, we're here. We got drug into adulthood. We didn't ask to be here, but we're here now. So let's make the best. <laughs> I just feel like, why didn't anybody tell me, you know, like right. I can give you a million things about the best part of being a child. Like, yes, naps. so many things. So yeah. Many things. But as an adult, especially an adult who parents somebody, um, yeah. you know, we just have so little time of like free adulthood. It's to enjoy like, yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Like I'm the person that I have to stay up until midnight because I have to extend the amount of time that I have alone. Yeah. Instead of just going to sleep at like 10, I got to be like, no, I'm getting in all this alone time. And then I wake up the next morning exhausted. I'm that. Person. Just to do it all over again. Like, yeah. It's wild. I understand. Yep. <laughs> I, I feel this. That. <laughs> I feel it, ladies. I feel it. This was so awesome. Obviously, you passed with, with whopping colors. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> um, <laughs> all the vibes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whitney, it, for people who want to continue to follow your journey, your podcast specifically, how could they do that? Yes. Yeah, so I, um, like a, we talked about, I have a podcast called Impostrix Podcast. It is to affirm folks of color who navigate imposter syndrome and racial toxicity in their career. Um, I started the podcast because I wanted to talk to worker bees, the people in the middle, not management, everybody else, about exactly what we've talked about today. So if you enjoy this conversation, I invite you to join us at Impostrix Podcast, and you can follow me on Instagram at Impostrix Podcast. And really just go to the website, www.impostrixpodcast.com. I love it. And we're going to have all this information inside of show notes. So you guys can continue to follow and support everything that Whitney Knox is doing. Everybody needs to seriously go follow this podcast because it's it's good. I've listened. It's good. Like, I just need y'all to, like, get behind that because these conversations got to happen. There can't be change Absolutely. unless we're not willing to do the change. So, um, yeah, y'all. This has been real. I really appreciate everyone for listening. Um, Cicely, any final thoughts for us today? Um, no, like I, as with every episode, I've just left the conversation today feeling lighter, feeling seen, feeling heard, feeling understood. Um, you know, and I always love to hear different perspectives. Like my husband's a very logical person and I'm the one who's coming with the vibes all the time. So it's really, it's <laughs> nice. You know, we need a little bit of everything, that yin and that yang, that balance, but I'm still, I'm gonna be, you know, vibing for the rest of my life. But I always love to hear just kind of the different perspectives and, you know, why we all can't be on vibes. And, you know, it helps me. It helps to ground me a little bit more. <laughs> I wish I could. I'm trying to get there. I really am because I feel a like. Bit of vibes. Don't don't overdo it. It's too much at once. It's not good for anybody. Oh, OK. <laughs> just doses, okay. Little okay. Doses of vibes. Micro dosing on vibes. Got yeah. it. <laughs> Hashtag microdosing on vibes. All right. In today's episode of MGG the podcast. Right. <laughs> yes. So thank you. And I appreciate you just being receptive to it. Cause I know like people used to think all the time, they're like, oh girl, like you dream too much, you be doing too much. I'm like, I'm not even doing enough. Like this is not even me all the way turned up. So you're just getting a little yeah, bit. <laughs> no, well, living down here in the South, I was just joking with a friend. Southern black folks are voodoo and vibes like see? see it's a it's a thing like they mm -hmm. are very religious but i also feel like they're very vibey spiritual and yeah, yeah yeah they, yeah, they might not the call elements. it that right, right yeah but that's what it is yeah are you from the south originally or no no i'm from seattle okay. the land of tech okay so yeah. see you'll be indoctrinated soon enough <laughs> <laughs> And your babies are growing up in the South now. I know. Um, yeah. Now they're Southern. They have the Southern <laughs> accent. 
they say open the dough instead of the oh door. My God. Oh, they, no. call, they call a cart a buggy instead of a shopping cart. Oh my gosh, I can't. Yeah, I'm trying to undo that for my kids. Oh, mm -hmm. oh, oh, I love it. It's, they are that's southern. Amazing. I love it. <laughs> I'm team cart, y'all. I'm sorry. I'm team cart. Right. What is a buggy? Why? My How? husband says buggy, and I can't. I can't. <laughs> but see, Kentucky's like mid south, so sometimes we don't count. Like, there's certain things that we say that are yes, very southern. And there are other things that, like, I feel are very Kentucky, like, not other people say them. Like, it's not the same. We're not as Southern as Georgia and some other states, <laughs> but we're not as Northern as, like, Ohio and Indiana either. It's a mm -hmm. weird in-between. It's very mm -hmm. strange. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All the more reason you should visit. Um, Just, to, just yes. pack up the kids. Kentucky, you strange. know, I hate to say it. You guys probably already know this, but <laughs> Kentucky isn't, like, a place that people think about. It's really not. It's, it's not. not. It's not. If I weren't from here, so I don't I know what I've ever thought here. about no. going to Kentucky. The only time I say Kentucky is when I'm going to KFC, which is not often. <laughs> See, that doesn't even I'll count. Like that's not even real Kentucky chicken. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, sure it's head. not. I'm My sure it's fried not. chicken's better. <laughs> like, it's, it's not. If we go find you some bourbon. Come for the bourbon. Come okay. for it. It's nothing. Okay, well, I'm not bourbon. a drinker, but well, I'll, fine then, Whitney. <laughs> I'm sure there will be something. There will be something that I can do in Kentucky. <laughs> oh my gosh y'all that's too y'all too much <laughs> um i have loved this conversation so much whitney thank you again for your energy your lie all the things um yes. sicily being sicily like all the things i just love it this conversation has been so <laughs> fruitful i love it um thank but you. we we do have to kind of wrap it up because we have we all have <laughs> little ones to kind of go back to so we had too much fun today oh my mm -hmm. gosh it's been great mm -hmm. um, it has been well, to wrap up, um, thanks for listening to the More Than Graphics podcast. Um, we invite you to subscribe and follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Send us your feedback on Facebook or Twitter on how our life stories and virtual safe spaces are helping educate, empower, or encourage you. As always, check out our website at mtgthepodcast.com and subscribe to our emails for exclusive behind-the-scenes moments like Clubhouse and LinkedIn Live happening in each space once a month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So until next time, everybody. And just like that, the episode ends, but the convo has just begun. Thanks for listening to the MDG podcast. We want to hear from you. If you enjoyed our podcast, give it a review on your listening app of choice. Continue to follow us across MTG social. And look out for bonus content releases throughout the year. This podcast is produced by Octane Design Studios. Until next time, friend.